I'm Mark Unger, producer of Roundtable. Because we find this presentation so special, we really would like for you to see this. Please watch. Good evening and welcome to Single Shot Show at Manhattan Neighborhood Networks Roundtable. Tonight we will be talking about labels attached to the visual art and uh, artistic license in general. And in order to discuss it, we invited two beautiful guests, brilliant photographer Sally Davis and uh, her beautiful dog. I the one. Huh? The one. The one. That's a beautiful name, especially for a photographer's dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, what we were talking before we started the show that uh, a lot of labels are actually attached to the photography and uh, a lot of times photographer expected to explain work and sometimes they just know the possibility when we was talking about uh, you participated in it it was just a situation when I was asking you whether the reasons for your photography are aesthetical or it's a street photography and you document in the street and basically said it really not something that can be labeled this way and by the way thank you very much Sally for joining us it's really thank you for me. a privilege to have you here already so uh, labels do you believe that there is any way we can actually define photography in general so it's by now became completely homogeneous and we just uh, forcing it on the, onto the image when we're trying to define it and put it in a specific category. Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. I think everybody needs labels to try and tell somebody what you're doing, how to brand you, who's going to buy your work, who's going to sell your work, you know, stuff like that. Oh. But, um, I think they're changing also. Like I think 50 years ago, 40 years ago, a street photographer, there wasn't very many people doing that. And it Absolutely. was a very specific thing. Gary Winogrand, you know, people like that. He was the yes. starter of it all. I don't think it's that easy anymore. I think it's, people are doing many different things. I think sometimes at this point, <laughs> if a picture's been shot outside, they call it a street photo. Well, technically that's what it is. Uh, usually they also say that it's uh, supposed to have some human interaction involved in it. But uh, if it's outside, it is one other way street photo indeed. But, uh, well, street photography indeed uh, changed. And uh, part of the reason is, of course, that there are more people readily available with their cameras or even just their cell phones to photograph. And some people actually did create some pretty good street photography with the mobile devices. I shoot with my cell phone all the time. I didn't get to that point yet, but I'm learning. Oh, no, no, I do all the time. And I print those, too, and they're quite beautiful. I mean, they can go fairly large. Well, that's uh, the evolution of the devices. So mm -hmm. Only shot five, ten years ago, photograph from a cell at best would be your reference for something else. Right, but uh, now you actually can create a compelling artwork which can be printed and Mm -hmm. put on a gallery wall. That's mm -hmm. indeed a fascinating thing to happen. But uh, getting back to the labels, <laughs> let's talk about your work. Uh, when we was talking about it, I uh, said that for me, uh, it's defined as art, visual art, more than anything else. And you said that most, most of the time when you're talking to people, they're trying to define it as pure street photography. Uh, I think one of the challenges that I have and that people have that work with me and sell yes. my work uh -huh. is that they're not sure. It is street photography, but it doesn't look like other people's street photography. It looks like it should be in an art gallery in I a different mean, way than black and white street photography. I looks. absolutely concur with that. And uh, besides the fact that it's very colorful and colors actually have very big importance in uh, your works, it's uh, 
just doesn't seem to be following the same objective because uh, correct me if I'm wrong but for me the objective of street photography basically the reason why this finger reaching for that shutter is uh, to document something to just freeze it in time and uh, maybe to discuss some kind of problem street photography was very social oriented mm -hmm. all the time it sometimes it would be more direct like obviously if you photograph the riot it's social photography right. it's talking about social issues but uh, if you're just photographing a local shop a kids plane it still describes the society and describes sometimes its advantages sometimes its problems and that's what street photography most of the time is defined as what uh, i see in your work it's more of a philosophical reflection on uh, life of the city uh yeah it is that but i also think in a hundred years if you looked at my photos they would tell you a lot about this city no, so in that way it is also sort of documentary even though i don't think that's my that's not my on purpose thing but well every photo if it's uh, not heavily modified as yours truly do is by definition is a uh, docu document document of yep, uh, something definitely. that happened at some point mm -hmm. but uh I would say that uh, documentary is also a complicated thing. If uh, I look at your photographs, it's not really documenting uh, a life of the city. It more documents its mood, its vibe. Bingo. Something correct. more uh, related to energy. That is 100% correct. Thank you. I love that you said that. And, uh, that's, that's true. That's, it. that's what I am about. It's about how I felt, how, how I feel about what I'm shooting, and how you feel looking at my photographs. Precisely. Yeah, and yeah. I agree. But people don't, that's, I should hire you. That's very good. <laughs> we can discuss it after <laughs> the program, definitely. Yeah, let's. But uh, that's uh, I, the feeling I'm definitely getting from your photos. But uh, besides that, it's probably the reason why uh, for a lot of artists it's so hard to put a label on their work themselves or to have somebody put the label and concurs it because mm -hmm. it's probably one of the most painful processes uh, to let somebody write about your work and then agree yes i would use it because no matter how good they are they wasn't there when you took this picture they wasn't there when you actually was growing up as an artist to the point when you would take this picture so, uh, so it's always will be wrong in one way or another and uh, that's probably why it's so complicated because uh, when you're talking about something that can be quantified and can be uh, defined in terms of simple logic then uh, the description would virtually write itself you have kids playing with hydrant dressed in a little bit of clothing in a summer day in Brooklyn you know exactly what it describes mm -hmm. both uh, factually and in terms of uh, its idea but uh, if you're photographing uh, say a dog sitting in front of the church and looking inside it's not an allegory anymore it's a symbol and it's a symbol it has a lot of meanings I guess but I think that's a good example the dog in the church um, I think there's a narrative there and I, I, that is something that I try to make sure you know when I'm shooting that there's some story there even if it's vague and the viewer ends up with their own story it, it, it draws a story out of the viewer I think well I guess uh, those who are artworks exactly the nightmare of those who trying to describe them but on the other hand they're most, the most valuable and the most interesting for the viewer because mm -hmm. the more uh, open the work for interpretation the more chances are for a specific person looking at it to find the interpretation that would actually resonate with themselves mm -hmm. and that's where the emotions probably help in a lot mm -hmm. so uh, let's talk about your series about i presume yours just as much uh, as much as mine favorite city the new york i know that you photographed recently a lot of downtown new york well i live downtown new york and um I had a very bad accident a few years back, about 10, 10 years or so, and I hurt my back. Uh -huh. And I had a big camera, a Canon 5D or something, and um, I couldn't carry it around anymore. Okay. And I was doing a lot of product photography, commercial stuff, and um, 
I decided that I either ha couldn't shoot anymore or had to get something really tiny that I could carry around. Nice. So I got a tiny little Sony mm -hmm. and the size of a pack of cigarettes. And um, I just started walking because I, I had to walk my dogs every day. That's how I started shooting outside. Oh, so the and I thought, I'm just going to shoot every day, everywhere I go, and I'm going to see how that goes. And really quickly, I started to go back to the same place, and it was gone. You know, mm -hmm. like a month later, I was like, oh, my God, that store is gone, or that, yeah. Well, that's so. actually something, a concept very appealing to me. I still uh, miss a few of the buildings that I didn't photograph to give an example those uh, hospital buildings on Roosevelt Island which was recently replaced with new glass and concrete uh, oh. complex I missed it by literally a week oh I'm sorry oh. that's a bad feeling well that's New York that's the nature of what is happening in a big well, city well these days these days it's pretty darn quick well just as well as our first section came and uh, we will be back after this brief pause <laughs> Today in single shot I'm going to tell you how to make a makeshift pinhole camera. It's actually very simple. All you need is a business card. I'm gonna use mine but you can use any. You need to apply two pieces of duct tape on it. Just like this. So they will be overlapping each other. And right in the middle of the cut from the inside pierce a small hole. The smaller and rounder it is, the better will be your result. And put this contraption right on the camera so uh, the hole is right in the middle of the lens space. Then point it at what you would like to take a picture of, put the camera on delay and take the shot. Voila! You have your pinhole camera shot. Thank you and watch us on YouTube. series of New York photographs starting uh, by necessity and as an accident so the whole body was the accident but I actually was meaning to ask you something else and by the way I think somebody is responsible present here is responsible for this <laughs> series as well yeah uh, my uh, question was uh, but what about the narrative in a specific shot is it premeditated or it just happens and uh, then noticed I go out to shoot Mm -hmm. And I'm often on a bicycle. Uh -huh. That's how I can go in and out of sort of dangerous areas, and I don't worry because I'm on a bike and I'm going oh, sort of quickly. I wasn't aware we still have any left. Oh, yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, at one in the morning oh, yeah, and that's down on the of Lower course. East Side, it can get a little funky down there. I can imagine. But um, no, I, I, there's nothing premeditated. I'm just looking, and I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, uh, you know, lighting, things that are very kind of boozy at night. I'm feeling kind of, you know, night. I don't know. I love to shoot at night because I feel like I don't have to do anything. I can be lazy. I just go out and poof, everything is lit up for me. Like a jewel box. I just have to pick what I want to shoot. Oh, I, you guess, know? I guess for each his own. For me, night photography was uh, the most complicated one. Specifically, Isn't that funny? Specifically because uh, there are areas that are overblown, but... Uh, what the human eye can see is not what camera can capture. So I know that True. 90% of what I see right now will not be in this shot, or some areas will be overblown completely out Correct. of proportion. Yeah. So for me, it was well, I think at this point, I'm 
compensate. I mean, I can adjust my camera. And also, everything is in RAW these days, so. Oh, that's for sure. I yeah. know. I know what I'm what I'm getting in there, oh, you know. Rose, and you know what? Sometimes I don't care if something's overblown and something's pitch black. It's more like how when you look at the print, it looks like how Absolutely. you feel it like you were really there, on you know. The photo, yeah. Yeah. Oh. I don't. Um, I can't stand that look. Whenever this is the new thing where people are with their dials, you know, on the computer, all the shadows are taken out, so everything's a sort yeah, of a the HDR look. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, is that what it's out? Yeah, everything is even, and there's nothing exciting. There's no mystery left. It's just uh, oh, there's see, no black blacks. There's no white whites. Right? You see, there is this expression which, by most photographers, is genuinely hated. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of the people who are not photographers themselves think they compliment an artist with saying it. Looks like a picture. Painting. Exactly. Looks like a painting. Looks like yes. a painting. Looks like a painting. Oh, I know. I, I hate that. Uh, most most of photographers who actually have a right to be called photographers have serious yeah. problem when they hear yeah. that. But apparently people who are not believe it's a compliment and uh, a lot of photographers uh, realized when HDR came into existence that uh, that's the means of getting it as close as, uh, to the painting look as possible. Because if you would look at it objectively, it's very close to 19th century watercolors. So some of the oils Oh, for as sure. Well. Hyper-realist modern painters even. Precisely, yeah, I agree. yes. I think years and years ago when HDR first came out, I think that I was fooling around with that a little bit and it didn't last long. I was just like all of a sudden it was everywhere and I didn't want one more person telling me that my stuff looked like a painting. I right. totally understand where you're coming <laughs> from with that. Yeah. I have heard it myself quite Even though I did used to be a painter. but. You know, I don't need to still be looking like a painter anymore after no, I've switched, absolutely. right? Uh, that, uh, you had a reason to switch to photography. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. By the way, uh, you mentioned that he was a painter. What kind of painting was it? Were you? Now, this is a question that I don't like to be asked. I know, it was a trick question. <laughs> I, don't like any trick, I don't like trick questions. Um, oh, Lord. Kind of pop. Uh -huh. uh, represent, rep, rep, you know, re representative. Um, I don't know. I, I can't. I would have to. We'd have to have a whole other uh, chat here over my paintings. Absolutely. But I painted I'm for years. I went to school to be a painter. Um, I sh when I moved to New York, I was a painter. I showed at galleries all over New York for years, and then finally, I always took photographs as well. But the painting was always my main thing, and so I switched at one so point. So it wasn't. An abrupt switch, it was more of a transition from prevalence of one media to another. Yes. You still paint or you no, completely finished? No, I do not. I'd like to, but it just is not possible right now. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I live in an apartment. Painting is a very messy business. Oh, I definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah, but when so. I get, you know, when I'm 90, if I live that long or 80, maybe I'll, I'll you know, start painting again. Wow. But I'm not finished with my photography. I, I haven't finished yet. I'm not quite sure what that means, but well, I'm still motivated every day to get out there and well, shoot. Well, that's one of the best motivations I personally know in the world. Right. But uh, talking about this transition, uh, what do you think was uh, motivating you to transition from something that at least by description sounds like uh, very bright and flashy and completely different direction to something more academic, even academic, in a very special and unusual way. Um, yeah, you can't, painting and taking photographs are completely like universes apart. They're not the Absolutely. same thing. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't focus. I couldn't sit. It's very isolating. You know, it just, I don't know. I just had it. I, I, I just had, I needed a break. So and the, the, to go out with the camera was fun. I could walk. I could take. I put her in my bicycle basket, and we drive all over the city and we take photos. You know, oh, it's just fun. That's fascinating. Yeah. So for you, it actually was more of a means of uh, communicating with the world, really, mm -hmm. in a way that uh, a works for way. you at this point of life yes. than anything else. Correct. Interesting. And you was mentioning that you was doing a lot of commercial work. Uh, 
with your big 5D. Yeah, well, so it seems big now. It didn't seem that big then, but yeah, it does uh, seem well, big a, now. It's a large I camera. worked for a magazine, and I did, you know, product photography, so which I sort of liked. It was good. So in what way it feels differently to work for commercial assignments and to work for yourself? I understand that it, it is different, but how is it um, for you? Well, it's completely, I'm just, it's no different except that I'm shooting totally different things. I mean, shooting product is, you know, you're mm -hmm. inside, you've, I don't know if you've, you've done it. It's oh, like you've absolutely. lights, camera, action. It's like being in the circus, the big top, you know, you put the thing and you've got a bunch of people around and poof, there you go. The street is totally different. You're out on your own. Nobody knows where you are and you don't know what you're going to find. It's like an adventure. Oh. Every night is an adventure. That's what I think. Wow, indeed it is. That's what street photography in general is about, to go on adventure and come back with something. That right, you like an egg hunt at Easter. Pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it is. Oh, treasure hunt for a pirate. It totally is. And yes. I'm going to go away soon. I'm going to go out to California. Wow. And, um, you know, that's always a challenge because uh, in New York is like, like I said before, a jewel box. I can walk around the block where I live. I've lived there for 20 years and every single time I get a different photo, something new, um, you know, that is fresh. You know, California is a little harder to, to um, everything's just kind of, I don't know, it's harder to find stuff to shoot there for me, like my style. Well, I guess. So it's a challenge, but that's okay. Right. Oh, uh, you was mentioning that there are a lot of old cars there, so I know that you're quite a fan of those. If yep. I remember correctly, you have a separate section for them. Yes. Oh, I have hundreds of them. I mean, I had to just put some on my website that was, you know, mm, a few. they definitely absolutely gorgeous. Mm, thank you. you know, besides this section, you actually have some scattered around other sections. So we will have a few minutes after this break to talk about cars and photographing vintage objects. Okay. Welcome to single uh, trick by single shot. It's a beautiful weather here in New York, perfect for outdoors photography. However, when you photograph uh, in a lighting like this, there is always one problem. Uh, objects on the ground, like myself right now, are much darker than a sky. Uh, most of you would say HDR is a solution. Yes, it is. However, there is a simpler, very old trick, the gradient filters. It's a completely analog way to make uh, your sky to be even in amount of light with your lamp. Even simple gray one will give you a lot, but besides that, you can use a blue one and make the sky to actually have more blue color in it. You can use sepia and make uh, a day to look closer to the sunset lighting. And even something as crazy as bright mauve color. The trick is to have gradient right in the middle of the lamp. During the break, we actually was talking about how art world is changing and street photography is changing. And because of that, I actually wanted to ask Sally our, at some point, customary question to our guests. What would be the advice for street photographer? What do you believe is the most important thing to know and to understand in order to take pictures of street scenes, but filled with energy just like yours? Well, it's different every year because the business is changing, you know? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important for kids or for whoever to find people who they love. Old people, the people who came even before me, 
Yeah. They're, oh, you know, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and understand what you love about those people's work and go from there. You know, to just get up in the morning and never take a picture and start taking pictures and know nothing about what someone did before you or who was great is a mistake. Well, I totally concur. Photography is not something that uh, easily can be just started without any background and without understanding on well, not the good. titans of Not good shoulders. photography anyway. No. Well, I don't know. Maybe there is a good photographer who did it, but I personally never encountered evidence of that. And I well, I just think it's, it's helpful. I mean, I think if someone is starting that off, I think it's very helpful to know what you like. And of course, you don't want to copy that person, but do it for a while and then go off on your own and see what well, you can do. A lot of time when we was discussing uh, basically putting yourself in perspective, uh, the question of uh, studying film photography surfacing and a lot of people actually talking very favorably about studying it just for better understanding of a process, for developing patience. I get that. So I what, understand are, that. what is your opinion on that? Because I'm personally completely digital. And... I started with film. I took film at, high, at college and um, I do not miss it one bit. I kind of like the look of it, but you can easily get that look with a computer if that's what you want. And um, it's toxic. You know, all those chemicals and in those dark rooms and sticking your hands in that stuff and smelling that stuff all day, that's not going to be good for you in the long run. I, I, I'm done. Like when, when the magazine said, we don't want that anymore, it has to be, you know, digital, I was like, thank God. Wow, wow. And I've never looked back. Well, I totally concur with uh, this approach on practical <laughs> level. I mean, that's exactly what I do. I didn't think about the chemical part, but indeed, as we said before, what really matters, what's really important is energy. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter whether it's a digital sensor or True. film in there in order to transmit this energy. And probably that's exactly what every photographer needs to focus on. It's a good photo that we want. And we don't really care how you got it, in a way. I don't care if you shoot on film or if you shoot, you know, with a Coke bottle. Right. I just I just want to like the photo. God bless you, right? Sally. You phrased it in <laughs> the most perfect, exact way it's that's possible. Kind of, it's true. Well, thank you very much. Anyways. It was really inspiring. Yes, thank you for having Can me. Continue uh, creating your thank beautiful you photos. I will be watching them from now on. Uh, thank you very much. Day. Thank you very much. All right. I hope you found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark Unger for Roundtable. Thanks for watching.